afternoon. Um, nice to see everyone. Welcome to Central Vermont, Ollie. Uh, today uh, we have with us, fortunate to have with us, UVM professor Jack Gerzinski, um, professor of political science, uh, and uh, the author of S Saving American Elections and Money Rules. And uh, we're going to be talking about the 2024 election, uh, the what it means for the state of democracy in the U.S. and what it could mean for the future of democracy. Um, Professor Gerzinski's area of study is American politics with specific interest in mass media, elections, campaign finance, and political parties. He has published five peer-reviewed books and dozens of articles and book chapters on these topics and has been member of research teams awarded grants by the National Science Foundation and the Joyce Foundation and has also been an expert witness and consultant in court cases testing campaign finance laws. So please welcome Jack Gerzinski. Thank you for that introduction, Anne, and thank you all for showing up for this and inviting me to have this conversation. I'm, I may wander around a little bit. I teach a, a large class of 120 people, so I think I'm going to talk loud without the microphone, if that's okay. Let me know if you can't hear me. Use the mic. Use the mic. Okay. <laughs> I've been overruled. <laughs> All right. Can you hear me okay now? All right. Uh, so what I envision for our, our, our session today is having a little bit of a setup, talking to you a bit about where political scientists are on their views about democracy in the U.S., talking a little bit about the 2024 election, uh, and then moving into a discussion, more of a discussion format about the elections, questions, and interactions. That's how I teach my class on elections, and the students really seem to be into the discussion aspect of it, and they raise an awful lot of uh, fantastic questions. So we'll let your interest dictate the flow of, of the conversation as we move along, if that's okay with you all. I hope it's okay with you all, because that's what I had planned. All right, so um, a little bit, now yeah, that's my car key. Uh, uh, yeah, don't, don't worry, it's too dark. So, um, a little bit about me so you know where I'm coming from in terms of my approach. So, you know, when I studied political science when I was younger, uh, a lot of people would wonder, what is political science? What are you doing? Uh, a lot of our students who come into our classes don't really understand what a political science professor actually does and, and what we study. Um, and so I think it's important, especially given our conversation, given the nature of discourse and politics these days, uh, that I tell you a little bit about where I'm coming from, the nature of my work and my studies very briefly. Uh, and basically, um, political, scientists are com um, political scientists use a number of different approaches to studying politics. We're a very eclectic discipline. There are those of us who focus on normative issues of political philosophy. There are those who study the law. And then there are those of us who are social scientists. And I'm a social scientist. Uh, and a social scientist is a person who attempts to try to understand what is going on in reality by applying the methods of science to determine what the patterns are out in reality in political behavior and to try to explain those. So, in essence, what we do is we develop theories of how the political world operates, and then we test those by measure, against reality, by measuring what's happening in reality, and see if our theories are supported. So where I come from is really uh, grounded in trying to understand what the political realities are at the time, and I know that's probably telegraphing some things to you guys uh, as far as the conversation. But that's my approach, that's what I prioritize over political values, over anything, a lot, anything beyond that, is that I really want an accurate read on the way things are as far as politics are concerned. So what I'm going to do is draw from a number of different books, I threw mine in there uh, as well, 
uh, that look at the state of democracy uh, and come at it uh, from a number of different angles. Uh, and what you'll find if you were to review the political science literature, if you were to survey political scientists, which one set of scholars actually has been doing over the past decade or so, is you find that those of us who study the U.S. political system uh, have a very high level of concern of where the U.S. is right now and where we're going in terms of democracy. It's often termed uh, backsliding, democratic backsliding. I don't know if you've heard that term. That was something that uh, uh, Levitsky and Ziblatt coined in their book, uh, How Democracies Die. So a lot of you might have heard of that book. It's a very popular book that was out a handful of years ago. Uh, written by a couple of people who study democracy around the world, and they looked at the patterns of how democracies slid back into undemocratic systems. Uh, and then they applied what they learned in the international scene to uh, what was going on in the U.S. Uh, the book, The Death of Expertise, by Tom Nichols, another political scientist, uh, looked at the public's attitudes about knowledge and expertise, established knowledge in society, and how we've turned into a culture that has a high disdain for expertise and knowledge, uh, and in a way that has led to an erosion of our ability to have any good political discourse. Uh, if we can't agree on basic facts and on basic set, a basic set of uh, knowledge about the world around us. Uh, back in 20. Ten, I published a book, Saving American Elections, I'm going to draw on a bit, about some of the flaws, the problems, or weaknesses in the U.S. political system specifically, uh, and the dangers of those weaknesses. And then finally, uh, Tyranny of the Minority is also by these two scholars, uh, and they echo some of the things that I had in my book, Saving American Elections, uh, about flaws or weaknesses in the U.S. political system. So that's just a little background. Maybe some extra reading assignments, if you would like. Uh, they're really good, well-written books. Uh, this one was really popular. But Tom Nichols, I don't know if any of you heard that name before, he now writes for The Atlantic. Uh, and he writes a lot of good columns on, on politics in the US. So weaknesses in US democracy. Uh, this is kind of along the lines of what I set up in my book, well, a decade and a half ago almost. If you look at how the U.S. system is set up, there are a number of weaknesses. Uh, and one, of those, one, one area of the weaknesses, you can identify the weaknesses according to structural weaknesses in U.S. democracy, statutory weaknesses, and also weaknesses as to how some of the institutions operate in the U.S. So the structural uh, inequality that comes from the way we set up uh, our Constitution long, long time ago, uh, basically makes sure it's set up a system where uh, everybody's vote doesn't necessarily count the same. Uh, and that is, as you well know, I'm sure, from the Electoral College, uh, that there are, there's the possibility that a candidate can win the popular vote and lose the presidential election because we have a system where it's a federal system for presidential elections where you need to win the 270 majority electoral college vote uh, in order to become president, and those electoral votes are cast based on the results of the individual states, with the exception of Nebraska and Maine, where they use congressional districts to award congressional, uh, to award electoral votes. Um, but the electoral college makes it so, uh, it, so that there's a built-in inequality in the system, not just in any particular election, where there are certain states that are battleground states that are really close to get all the attention and everybody else is basically ignored. ignored. But it also creates a certain amount of inequality so that votes in certain states are worth more in determining the presidency than other states. Every state gets uh, electors, electors awarded to each state equal to the number of US senators and the members of the US House. Uh, so there's a built-in advantage to small states. Small states always get at least two from their Senate and then one uh, from their congressional district. So our vote in, in um, Vermont is actually worth a lot more. That is, we're represented uh, by uh, our, our representation in terms of people versus electors is 
there's a lot fewer people per elector in Vermont than, say, across the lake in, in New York or in California. The U.S. Senate also builds in uh, a certain amount of inequality to our system for the same reason, but the, the, the proportions are even worse. Every state gets two votes, part of the compromise when the Constitution was created. Uh, and what that, what that does is that gives the smaller states a lot more power in this cons the um, composition of the U.S. Senate. And because of that, uh, you end up with patterns such as we have now where a minority of the country actually can control the U.S. Senate, and we've seen that in recent years, uh, and that has major implications for things like the composition of the U.S. Supreme Court, since the Senate is the body that actually um, uh, confirms the appointments of the president to the U.S. Senate. So we have built in equality. We've had this all along, uh, but as uh, the authors of the book Minority Tyranny, or Tyranny of the Minority, point out the way our patterns in our elections have evolved, uh, that's given much more power to the Republican Party because their base is in their smaller states, and that smaller state base for, and rural state basis for the Republican Party allows them to control bodies like the U.S. Senate, uh, even without winning a majority of the popular vote nationwide, right? which then determines who is in the U.S on the U.S. Supreme Court, which then can make decisions such as overturning Roe v. Wade, which goes against popular will in the United States. All right, we have statutory inequality, that is inequality built into our system in the laws. The biggest areas you're probably familiar with are campaign finance. Uh, back in the 1970s, the U.S. Supreme Court decided that spending on elections was the same as speech and therefore protected by the First Amendment, and they prohibited governments from regulating campaign spending uh, because it was the equivalent of speech. And what that has allowed over time, uh, and through additional court cases like the Citizens United court case, is it has allowed the inequalities of wealth in our system to turn into inequalities in political power, all right, by not regulating how much people contribute uh, in terms of campaigns. Uh, laws governing, registra governing registration and voting also uh, have been part of a bitter uh, comp or com have been part of uh, bitter political battles in recent years. Uh, the Republican Party has decided that new voters uh, and voters that are at the lower end of the socioeconomic scale are not likely to vote for them. So they have devised laws in the states where they, dis where they administer elections to make it harder to register, to make it harder to vote, uh, in essence suppressing voter turnout uh, in our elections, and that of course feeds inequality in our system. Then briefly on to media and public opinion. Our media system has evolved into a system that values outrage negative emotions uh, um, and a focus on the horse race as far as elections are concerned. Uh, and most of our media coverage is devoid of real substance that would allow citizens to understand what their choice is, including providing them with a big picture of what this election means uh, for your future. Uh, instead, our media, which is for profit mainly, uh, entertains us. And uh, unfortunately, and it's unusual to think of it this way, but, Ameri but uh, humans are much more attractive to negative information. And so the media really piles on the negativity and the outrage, which turns off a lot of voters, and it also makes a lot of voters cynical about whether their choice actually matters in an election. Um, the public, uh, you know, we are a product of our culture and our culture is driven largely by our media these days. Uh, and the culture has produced basically a citizenry that is cynical, poorly informed, doesn't really see the big picture well, uh, and uh, is very, is, has difficulties separating fact from fiction, and very susceptible to conspiracy theories. So this is something, you know, long before Trump came along, uh, the U.S. political system 
uh, observers argued was in danger from these different trends that were taking place. And you can see it pop up a number of times. You know, if you think back to the 2000 presidential election, the whole electoral college and local administration of elections played a big role in that outcome. Uh, what is it, 375 votes, 500? Sorry, it was 300. What? Hanging chads, pregnant chads, dimpled chads, the Florida dis disputes over the Florida election, which the Supreme Court ultimately shut down. Uh, but it was 357 votes, I think, was the margin of victory in Florida. Uh, and so, uh, and there were a lot of votes that uh, it's argued were not counted in that election. Uh, but that's a good example of how the problems existed before. Uh, they just have gotten worse and worse. And unfortunately, uh, and this comes from both sides of the political aisle. Uh, Donald Trump has exacerbated, taken advantage of the situation, and he's exacerbated the, sisters, the situation and made it worse to a great extent. What is going on? Oh, I'm hitting the wrong button. Um, the final aspect in terms of the state of, of democracy, you've all heard about political polarization and the negative ap impact that it's had on our political system. This idea that we've sorted ourselves into different tribes and that we basically lob insults and, and have a lot of negative emotions about those who are on the other side of the political divide. Um, we have, one thing I wanna make clear about political polarization is that polarization, uh, the difference between the political parties or the different sides in a political system uh, there's an aspect of polarization that is good. And the aspect of polarization that is good is that the two parties have very different visions of the future to offer to voters, and that the voters know they are gonna get two different, very different things depending on, uh, on whether one party is in office versus the other party, all right? So that's kind of the uh, ideological divide. And if you think about it, that helps people in terms of their voting if it's clear what you're gonna get from one side or the other. The problem with polarization in our system really uh, is that uh, animosity that is developed. That people think that the other party is going to bring the end of the country uh, and that there's an awful lot of negative emotions associated with people of the opposite party. That's the problem in terms of polarization and that's the era we're in. And definitely our media system inflames that aspect or problem with our system. So the other thing in terms of their polarization and, and animosity is that there are these democratic norms that some of those scholars talk about that we seem to not be honoring anymore in our system, including institutional forbearance, which is the notion that you follow, uh, that you don't use all the power that you have in the system to the extreme extent that you restrain yourself to a certain degree, otherwise the other side will go even further because our constitutional system is set up with a lot of ambiguity uh, in it. Um, and a good example of institutional forbearance breaking down, you can see over the, the debates or battles the Republicans and Democrats have had in filling seats on the US Supreme Court. So back in Obama's last term, uh, you had a seat open up uh, when, I believe it was Scalia, uh, passed away while he was uh, still a member of the Supreme Court, and that was about 10, 11 months out from the election. Mitch McConnell uh, was said, we're not gonna fill that seat. He was under, he had authority to do that, but no party had done that before, that far out from an election. And he said, we're gonna wait for the election. Then when, you know, Four years later, Ruth Bader Ginsburg dies. What does he do? And within weeks of the election, they fill that seat. So that's an example of just using your political power to the maximum amount and not really respecting that uh, the other party and some sort of balance and holding back in terms of what you do. Um, uh, mutual tolerance, the other political norm, uh, is the one where you see people who disagree with you as opponents, not as enemies. Good example of that was when John McCain uh, uh, basically admonished his own supporters who were attacking Barack Obama, and when he would appear on news shows, he would say, no, 
you know, Barack Obama is not my enemy. He's my opponent. And he's a good, upstanding individual, uh, and he's not a Muslim. I think you all rem probably remember back to the 2008 election on that case. But that was a good example of a politician trying to push this notion that, yeah, we disagree, but we're not enemies. And we've lost that to a high degree in our system. Uh, and then finally, all of this builds up to the potential for violence, and we can talk more about that in the question and answer uh, period. But we've already seen outbreaks of violence, political violence in the U.S. So as far as the current election is concerned, I hate standing at podiums. I like moving around a lot more. Uh, so as far as the current election is concerned, there's quite unanimous agreement among political scientists that Donald Trump really represents a threat to our democratic system. Uh, and again, he's not the reason we're here. Uh, the changes that have happened over our system have been gradual in terms of the breakdown of democratic norms, in terms of other dis dysfunction in our system. So for example, around the mass media. Uh, but he has definitely exploited it and he's exacerbated it. Um, and that includes the spread of misinformation and disinformation, including the big lie about the 2022 election. Uh, the uh, in-group, out-group discourse that he has about real Americans versus immigrants who are murderers and rapists coming into our country, or any other way that he wants to divide. Recently, he's been talking about people who disagree with him as the enemy and wanting to use uh, military for the U.S. military to punish them in retribution. That's the talk of an authoritarian, someone who does not support a democratic society. Uh, the trust only me kind of approach, where, any, where he wants his supporters, he wants the public to only believe him if there's any information that comes from any other source. The news media, it's fake news. Uh, even members that you, individuals who served in his own cabinet who come out and say he's not fit for uh, office. He turns around and he says that, oh, they've become part of the deep state or, you know, weaves them into uh, a conspiracy theory so people disregard what they have to say and they only trust Donald Trump. You should be wary of leaders who want you only to trust them. That should be a red flag for everybody. Uh, his attempt to, to overturn the 2020 election, uh, a lot of my students are unaware and a lot of people seem to have forgotten a lot about what happened at that time, that it wasn't just the riots of January 6th, uh, but that um, you know, he built up uh, by constantly lying about the election results without any evidence to support his claim. Uh, that there was, you know, that the election was stolen, that inflamed passions that led to people invading the, the, uh, the Capitol on January 6th. Uh, they were in a number of different battleground states. They set up slates of fake electors. A number of these individuals who were fake electors and those who helped to set them up uh, during the process are actually uh, in court. Some of them have been indicted at this point. Uh, for falsifying legal documents claiming that they're actually electors who are allowed to vote in the Electoral College. Uh, they lobby, he lobbied elected officials to change the results. I don't know if you remember his phone call to Brad Raff, 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 Raffensperger, sorry, a little sped up, trying to fit too much in here. Uh, trying, you know, asking him for just enough votes to overturn Georgia's results. Uh, they lobby, he lobbied, and that wasn't the only uh, state government that he lobbied to try to overturn the, the votes. Um, he did take this to court, so a lot of times like J.D. Vance in the vice presidential debate said, you know, we just wanted to have this out in the open and debate it. Well, we did. They just want to continuously relitigate it even though they have no information or evidence to support their claim. It was about 60 court cases. They're all thrown out. They were ridiculed by judges that were appointed by Donald Trump because they had no evidence to support their claims that there was fraud in the election or that the election was stolen. Uh, and then, of course, January 6th. So um, he's already signaling his unwillingness to accept defeat in the 2024 election. Uh, so bottom line, and I figure hopefully this stirs things up, 
Uh, you know, if you see this from the perspective of democracy, and certainly you can see it in people like Dick Cheney and Liz Cheney coming out and endorsing Kamala Harris and saying that Trump is a danger to democracy, even those two are extremely conservative individuals. They, they wouldn't agree with Kamala Harris on 99% of the policy matters she would, she would push once in office, but they see the threat to democracy as so dire that they're willing to cross over and endorse Harris and try to encourage people not to vote for Donald Trump. Uh, so seen from that light, that also helps explain why Republican officials have endorsed Harris and opposed Trump. And even if you don't see it that way, and we talk about this as well, the policy differences between the Democrats and the Republicans right now are so great and they have been in the last couple of decades. The political parties, the ideological polarization is such that there is very little uh, that is similar between the two parties anymore. And so the choice is really clear. If people look into the different policies uh, and uh, see where they stand, they'll see that their choice is, is crystal clear as far as this election is concerned. So, kind of wanted to throw all of that out you, at you. Uh, if you want to turn up the lights. And then I want to move it to a discussion uh, uh, about the election and questions that you have or would like to discuss as far as the election is concerned. Sorry. Yes, it is depressing. You should, uh, <laughs> political scientists are really, our anxiety levels are incredibly high <laughs> right now <laughs> because we've studied this for years. And this, you know, I know this seems one-sided, but this is not about party. And you know, I've taught at UVM since 1992, and for years in teaching American politics, teaching about elections, teaching about parties, it was easy to inhabit the, the sides, both sides, and make the argument for my students. But when you have an individual like Trump, who you know, is really anti-democratic, you know, that kind of, it, it's impossible for someone who supports democracy to get in that space and, and defend them in a logical way that is built on re evidence from reality. Sorry, your name is? Hi. Um, I wanted to, to ask what you think of the report that was in the New York Times that Trump supporters know that he lies, they accept that he's a liar, but they assume that this, uh, all of this uh, talk about, you know, almost like a demagogue type, type of talk. It's part of the act. It's part of his shtick, if you will. That's what they said in 2016, you know, and, and yeah, exactly. No, I've read that, and it's most frustrating in one of the areas where American public is really failing thanks to our culture, and you know, a lot of our weaknesses are not because people are stupid, but it's we're all part of a political culture and we can only know what we know based on you know, what our media environment provides, our conversations, our levels of education, things along those lines. But that's exactly what they said back in 2016. And then we have you know, those, that rhetoric turned into violence and people died on January 6th. Uh, that rhetoric led to people feeling much more comfortable espousing racist and anti-LGBTQ attitudes that actually harmed individuals. So they like to fall back on that, but that's ignoring the real history. Uh, it's just like uh, I read recently that, you know, the pols pollsters were trying to figure out why, uh, you know, Hispanic or Latino voters were uh, supporting Trump in a little more numbers this time around. And they interviewed them and found them and said, well, he's not talking about us. And it's like, actually, uh, at a rally, I guess, yesterday, um, one, uh, uh, a Hispanic uh, official down in Arizona basically said to her audience, and she's uh, Latina, it's like, no, he is talking about you. Uh, don't fool yourselves. So they, they, you know, they don't take any of his comments serious, seriously. Uh, and then they're going to be surprised in terms of the actions that actually take place. Yes, the structural problems are way beyond comprehension, and I hope that somebody like you will be able to do something about that. <laughs> what upsets me is the lack of honesty, and that's very old-fashioned, I know. But it brings to mind all the misinformation and lies that go on 
brings to mind two quotes from very divergent sources. One is Confucius, and he said that um, the trouble with lying is not only that people don't believe the feelings after a while, but communicate or lie to anyone else. And then the other quote is from Wayne Say the Confucius again. I'm sorry, Confucius, <laughs> one of my wonderful sources. Um, he said that the trouble with lying is not that people don't believe you after a while, which doesn't seem to be true right now, but that you can't believe other people because you think they are lying too. And the other quote is from a football coach at the high school where I was working in the library. And he said, and I think this is the governing motive right now, Winning is the only thing that counts. No ethics. Thank you. Those, those are great quotes. The second one is a good example of how politics has become more about the pure exercise of power as opposed to democracy. And that breakdown of institutional forbearance is a good example of that. It's just using power to its fullest if you have it. And so it's all about winning. And Mitch McConnell was you know, really in it following that playbook exactly. And then, yeah, in terms of honesty, how it's totally broken down. He, you know, Trump has, through just floods of lies and outrageous statements, has just made the whole public you know, inured to lying uh, to the point that they, you know, they just accept it, it's just an act with him as opposed to that he's actually telling mistruths that actually can have real harm. And other examples after the two hurricanes down south and the impact that his lies and his conspiracy theories have had on that. So yeah, we're, it, it seems like we're in a completely different reality from 2000. Do you remember when Al Gore was constantly dogged for being a liar for a few things that he said? It just pales in comparison as to what is going, it comes out of Trump's mouth right now. But we really don't seem to, at this point, we've given up on valuing honesty among our public officials. Um, and so the question is, you know, if you don't believe anything Trump is saying, what are you going to get from Trump if you're supporting him? Does it? Sorry. Depending on the historical example, which you're probably going to get into anyway. In the early 30s, there was a certain political party. Uh, there was a loud mouth. A little bug of mustache, and everybody said, Nobody can believe that what this guy is saying, except when he got into power, that's exactly what he did. So, who is to say that Trump is not saying exactly what he's going to do? Exactly. And if, if you look at the record in his first term, you see that a lot of the things that he said and the way he approached things came true. His total distrust and, and his pushing distrust for expertise and established knowledge killed hundreds of thousands of people during the pa COVID pandemic. I mean, you know, you give him credit for really putting a lot of money and effort into backing the development of the vaccines, but then he turns around and discourages people from getting the vaccines. And that killed people. You know, in terms of, like you said, it, you see his pattern, his, his uh, untrustworthiness, if you would, but also his disdain for knowledge and facts and information, and that has real world consequences for, for us. You know, he did try to work on building a wall. Uh, you know, he, some of the things that he did argue he would do came true. His, his rhetoric at attempting to tear down other democratic institutions during his tenure. He continued that and people's belief and support in those institutions continue to go down. And so that now we don't know who to trust. My students come to classes, I don't know what to believe. There's so much material out there, so much inf misinformation that's flooding, the, the air, flooding our, our information environment that it's hard for people to know what to believe. I'm gonna go in the back here and hand off the microphone. Um, I think we're all laser focused on polls right now. And I wonder if you have any opinions or analysis of the many polls that are out there, what we should pay attention to or not. That's a great question. Ezra Klein in the New York Times a couple of days wrote a column, said ignore the polls. Ignore the polls is what I would say. There are right now, and I use polling in my research. Uh, so. 
you know, it's a methodology I'm very familiar with. And right now, pollsters are really scrambling to figure out how they actually get an accurate sample of those who are actually going to vote. And there, there's a lot of disagreement in how they're doing it. And a, a lot of the polls are relying on methodology that would replicate what happened in 2020. But the problem with that is the electorate in 2024 is very different. Uh, so we don't know who's going to turn out. Uh, so those polls could be way off in the important area, and the important area being those state polls. And because that's oftentimes the state polls in the battleground states, those tend to be the weakest in terms of their methodology. So do yourself a favor, ignore the polls. There's, you know, you, if you're kind of thinking about how the race might go, you can look at a lot of other indicators. Uh, one of the things that might have a big impact on turnout are the ballot measures on reproductive rights that could spur a really high turnout among more liberal voters and among women uh, who tend to break much more towards the Democratic Party. Uh, so th I, if they're going on the basis of the 2022 election, or the 2020 election, um, you know, they may not be capturing that. Young voters were much more invigorated when uh, Kamala Harris got in the race and Joe Bri Biden dropped out. So we don't know how that's going to play. Uh, African American uh, 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 males uh, seem to be siding a bit towards, not, the majority still support Kamala Harris, but Trump has gained among that group. But the question is, are those individuals going to turn out? So polls are really a problem that way. And there's, there's another reason to ignore polls, and that is because of our obsession with the horse race, our obsession with seeing politics as a sport, and we can thank the media for that. And you know, the media basically uh, pay for most of these polls because they provide news stories for them and allow them to frame the election as this exciting contest for us, and they really distract us from what the election really means to just following the polls and who's ahead, who's behind, and trying to figure out how it's going to turn out, as opposed to what does this election mean for Americans, for you, uh, and for the world, for that matter, for the state of democracy, for the policies that are being implemented. Um, sorry I used your question to go off on a little rant there, but um, I. I don't, I still see headlines and I try to ignore them and it's hard. Like, I listen to NPR and so this morning there's like a whole bunch of new polls out and it's like, I, d I really don't want to hear that. Why don't you, you know, bore us a little bit with the details of the policies that they're going to enact. For example, you know, sorry, continue my rant a little bit. The, the whole Trump supporters saying, you know, they're going to vote for Trump because prices have gotten so high and inflation really bothers them. And cornerstone of Trump's policy proposals are the tariffs, which economists of all ideolo ideologies will tell you that's going to increase prices dramatically. And so why isn't the press talking more about that and really pinning Republicans and Trump uh, on, well, if you do this tariff, you raise these tariffs, you're going to have, that's going to really increase prices for, for everybody, whereas inflation rate, yeah, prices are still high to a certain degree, but the inflation rate has come down dramatically. The American public doesn't seem to realize that the economy is in really good shape, uh, in part because, you know, our media focuses mainly on the polls and on the horse race. Uh, and Trump keeps us busy, uh, or the media busy, it's like catnip for them. Every time he says something outrageous, they have to cover it. And it's, I don't know if he, that's intentional, but it's brilliant. I mean, we're constantly chasing after, or the media is chasing after all of that. Uh, hi, I'm Mary Alice, and I'm a, a progressive, a progressive Democrat, and I don't see any answer. I also was a, was a political science major in college in the 50s, a very different time. But I, uh, just the inequity, the inequality in our country. Our democracy is going down and nobody's paying attention. I'm a healthcare advocate and th there's, nobody cares about the fact that we don't have universal healthcare in this country. And there are, th and housing, all these things. And 
and we have candidates, even the Democratic candidate is much too conservative for me. And we're at, we're at the point of being in World War III. Uh, we, we, we might as well be in World War III if you watch the news, and I watch uh, Vermont Public every night, so <laughs> I know what's going on, and listen to NPR too. Uh, it, it just is insane, and you know, I'm glad I'm the age I am because I'm just so afraid of the future, regardless of who we choose. There's a lot to unpack in that answer. One thing, I wanna give you a little bit of hope uh, I teach this large class on elections, and we just had this discussion uh, about whether their generation cares. And definitely Gen Zers are actually really engaged and really concerned and really involved. So there is hope in the future in the, the younger generations. On the party differences, I think that might be a good thing to talk a little bit about and move that into a discussion of the two-party system a little. Um, we we you know, a lot of people already have some discontent and might want to vote for like a third party candidate or something as a matter of protest or whatever. Uh, what? <laughs> Sorry. Don't, yeah. Well, we've been around long enough to know. I mean, I voted for John Anderson in 1980. And I'm like, God, that was a mistake. You know? And Ralph Nader voters, back to Florida, 357 uh, margin in Florida. How many Ralph people voted for Ralph Nader in Florida? 97,000, if just a tiny amount of them. And we know how they would vote from exit polls in New Hampshire, where also, if the Ralph Nader voters had voted for Al Gore, Al Gore would have been in office, uh, because they told pollsters, well, if Ralph Nader wasn't in, in the race, we would have voted for Al Gore. So history shows the futility of those third party votes. You're not gonna change the system that way. And nobody knows why you're voting third party. So that notion of your vote being your voice, I actually object to, because I think that really downplays the importance of your vote. Your vote is your exercise of power in our political system. It's not just you expressing your opinion. You can do that to a pollster. Voting is about a collective effort to gain control of the government so that the government does what you want. And that's why our political parties exist. They wanna gain control of government to implement policies uh, that their voters support. So in our system, we have two political parties. I don't know if, you know, if anybody's discussed this before with you, but the reason why we have two political parties is that we have single member districts we for legislative, most legislative races. Obviously, Washington County, we vote for three state senators here. But in most of our contests, we elect one representative per district, we elect one executive. And what that does is that creates an incentive behind those organized who are in, in politics to try to build a majority in order to win those elections. So we have what is known as a majoritarian system. You win by building a majority of supporters before the election. In essence, you have to put together a majority coalition. And here's where I'll disagree a little with you, Mary, on this one in terms of the Democrats. If you look at the American public in terms of their ideology, there are more conservatives in the US public than there are liberals. Most people identify in the middle somewhere. But the Republicans can run a more pure conservative platform because they have more supporters on the conservative side. The only way the Democrats can win is to build a center-left majority. And they have to build that before the election again in order to win. So that means that people, you know, that everybody's gonna be unhappy with some of the policies that party proposes. But then, you know, stepping back and looking at the big picture, yeah, you may only get eight out of 10, 80% of what you want from the Democratic Party. But if the Republican Party is elected, you know, you're gonna get 90% of the things you don't want. Yeah, sorry. I, I'm not trying to persuade anybody. I'm just, in terms of our two-party system. Uh, so, the, you know, in, in multi-party systems, a lot of progressives, not progressive party, but just progressive or liberals, like to say we should have a multi-party system. Uh, and that would solve all of our problems. Not really, because if you think about how things operate with a multi-party system, 
What you have in a multi-party system is you'd have parties that are a little more pure ideologically. So you might have much more liberal parties that would make you happy in your vote. But because of the nature of the populace as a whole, none of those parties is going to get a majority if you gain control of the government. So what they have to do is they then have to build a majority after the election. And they have to make the compromises with the other parties at that point. And then you as a voter lose out then in terms of getting exactly what you want. And you don't even have control over the coalitions they build. They might, because of the nature of the results, have to really include someone that's a, you know, an extremist party that you really disagree with, but they have to make concessions to them. Uh, and so, you know, in terms of our two-party system, yeah, there's some discontent. But one, you know, it's because we build our majority coalitions before the election. And two, the construction of those majority coalitions is also in the voters' hands in our country, unlike in other countries, because we have primary elections and they don't in other systems. So we can shape the direction of the parties. Donald Trump has changed the direction of the Republican Party, and a lot of traditional Republicans don't recognize their party anymore because of how he has shifted that party, and that's thanks to the voters in those primaries. Bill Clinton, back in the 1990s, uh, shifted the Democratic Party more towards the center, arguing we got to do that in order to win. We got to build that majority coalition. And he was successful. Bernie Sanders helped shift the Democratic Party. He lost you know, his primaries for the presidency, but he definitely changed the policies of the Democratic Party to make them more liberal. And then, because of his support, he ended up with important uh, committee assignments in, in the Senate and exercised an awful lot of influence uh, in terms of policy and power that way. So there's that discontent about the two parties, but you, you know, people kind of myopically look at the choice in one particular election and go, oh, I don't like either, either of these candidates. You need to sort of step back and see the system as it operates more as a whole and where you can have an influence. And then finally, uh, and Secretary of State uh, Hanses actually came to my class as well and she made this point that was really important, is that elections aren't your only way to influence politics. So in an election, you pick a side that's most likely to listen to you, and then you get involved in those groups that really ha lobby and try to influence government. So like on political reform, there are a lot of groups that really push for political reforms that get, you can have an impact on the system, uh, that you, know, you get the side that's more likely to listen and maybe be s open to such proposals, and then you're part of those groups that lobby and try to have an influence on the, pro the actual policies of government. Sorry, I'm rambling on very long here. We'll go over here. How much of an influence do you think gerrymandering is going to have on the outcome of the election? Oh, God, that's a long story. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that, that, you know, in terms of the U.S. House, the Democrats have a pretty good chance of picking up the House despite gerrymandering, but there are different maps, different advantages in different states, and the Democrats have won some battles in some states that will, will help them out. Um, but the way we draw our legislative districts is really problematic for how we exercise power, and the best illustration is that is to look at the Republican caucus in the House of Representatives uh, over the past four years and how they've been captured by the extreme part of their party. They have a, m a, s a, s a, they have a very small majority but they have a lot of members that come from districts that are so lopsided in favor of their party that the only way to win that district is to be an extreme candidate on the right. And that, you know, that's part of the problem that, ge that is created by gerrymandering, that we built these districts, or states build these districts, that are so favorable to one party or the other that it just really encourages the extremists and the parties to win over in those districts. And, you know, some of this occurs on the left as well. The left is not uh, the saints in this whole equation. Uh, there are plenty on the left who spread misinformation, uh, conspiracy theories as well. Um, but that's led to, you know, it's not just about winning the election, but it's also governing. And we've seen how it can really hamstring a speakership and a, a, a majority in, in the House of Representatives because of the way our districts are drawn. It's not all just the drawing of the districts, by the way. It's also uh, residential patterns where people have moved. People have been gravitating. You know, if you're 
Democrat, you've been moved, people have been moving to blue areas, Republicans, so there's been a sorting of the electorate in that area as well that adds to these problems in terms of um, uh, governance and how it's tied to our elections. Sorry. Yes, I, I just happened to bring up on my computer a, um, um, yeah, an issue. No electronic devices. <laughs> but I guess, I, you know, I don't see political ideology at all being the main problem. I think it's criminality in the three, um, in the executive branch, in the legislative branch, and in the judicial branch. I think that's the biggest issue. And um, so. Every time someone opens up their mouth, <laughs> they're committing a crime. I mean, we have to understand that politicians lie. They want to get elected, but they're never held accountable for those lies. Uh, and, okay, so that's, that's one of the big things. Can we, can we hold that for a moment? And sure. Talk about because I have another question. Sure. So that goes back to the, the comment that, I'm sorry, you, Anne made. Trump makes us believe everybody lies and that we can't believe what they say they're going to do when they're in office. And that's one of the biggest myths about politics in the US uh, before Trump came along. Uh, the belief that politicians just say things get elected and actually won't do them. All right. Studies by political scientists have looked at platforms, have looked at speeches, and they're even PolitiFact, uh, which is a fact-checking site, a uh, nonprofit organization. You know, going back to the Obama years, they looked at all the Obama promises, and then looked at what Obama did in terms of trying to get those accomplished. And the studies find that, considering the fact that you know we don't elect a dictator, so they can't do everything they want to do, especially if Congress is controlled by the other party. But the research has shown that those candidates are really good at keeping their promises, and that party platforms are a really good predictor of what they will do. Just take a look at Joe Biden. A large amount of the population thinks he hasn't accomplished anything, or he didn't do what he promised to do. The Inflation Reduction Act, an incredible investment, historic investment, in fighting climate change. That, that was part of, that's because he's not a dictator. In order to win over Joe, uh, uh, the senator from yeah, Manchin, from West Virginia, he had to make a compromise. Our system requires compromise, so he had to make that compromise in terms of opening up uh, resources on uh, carbon. So you're not going to get something pure, but you still get an incredible investment, historic, unlike anything that's happened in the world, in terms of fighting climate change. The Infrastructure Act. You know, Trump kept saying he was going to do yet infrastructure week after week after week after week. Previous Democratic and Republican presidents tried to invest in infrastructure in the U.S. No one accomplished it. Biden accomplishment and with votes from Republicans. Uh-oh, I'm doing the Bill Clinton thing. You know how I used to do this, uh, at least. What? But you, you, this is where, hold on. This is where you have to think big picture. You're going to lose some, but on the bigger picture, are you winning more than you lose? And this goes the same thing to the party coalitions. So you can find a lot of specific policies that you don't like, but if you put them, if you could keep a scorecard of the whole game, so to speak, shoot. Now I'm using the media's framing of elections. <laughs> uh, you know, of the whole, the way things play out, you'll find that you're probably more happy, you're happy with nine out of 10 things that are going on. You're not gonna get everything you want from the government because not everybody wants the same thing you do and our system is structured to force compromise. And, and in fact, part of our problem in our system is uh, we lost the ability to compromise and to concede on certain areas in order to get other things. Other policies the Biden administration passed that they promised, the CHIPS Act, the act to protect veterans in terms of the burn pits, uh, the gun control legislation that they passed. Then, looking beyond not just the policy matters, but you also have to look at the administration in terms of the rules that the bureaucracies issue uh, to implement policies. Uh, 
And you will see that the Biden administration has been incredibly successful. I would put money on it that in his, histor historians will look back at on this administration as one of the most productive ones in recent history, much more so than the Obama years, for example. Uh, that you, if you look at it from that perspective, the bigger picture, that yeah, you're gonna have to compromise, you're gonna have to lose on some of these things, that's the nature of politics. Sending people. Sending Pulling up here on on the, um, I, I have I have an article from um, Consortium News, um, and with regard to Kamala Harris's distinguished career of serving in justice while she was an Attorney General. Oh no, let me finish. I have the floor. Uh, excuse me. Then I have another question with you with regard to reliable sources. Well, this is a time to question, and I'm, well, I'm going to finish very quickly. Um, the um, Kamala, Kamala Harris, the article is Kamala Harris, uh, her, Kamala? Yeah, what her, what her record is as Attorney General and um, uh, a uh, uh, state's attorney when she was in California, and it's quite dismal, and it's very concerning. However, what I wanted to ask you as a scientist, last question, I promise not to take this any, anywhere else here. I just wanted to ask you if you ever canvassed your students for what they, ha what they use for news sources. What do they listen to? What do they read? That, that's a really appropriate question on the end of this because that is not a reliable news source that you pulled up. Um, and one, one of the problems that we have in our culture is that pu the public has trouble trying to figure out what to believe out there, what news sources are reliable. I teach media and politics and so it is the whole focus of a class in terms of where you get reliable information. And part of what our job is in, at the university is to teach information literacy so they can cut through the misinformation that's out there uh, and try to get at what information they can trust. Uh, so red flags should pop up just in terms of the wording of, of, of that information that you read out that that's clearly coming from a biased source that's a partisan source and that clearinghouse that's not a legitimate source for, for journalism. Uh, so finding out what sources are valuable or reliable is really key. In our culture, you know, Trump and the, for going way back to Spiro Agnew and Nixon, the Republicans have been trying to tear down journalism and the traditional media for ages, constantly attacking it for having a liberal bias, the lamestream media, you've heard all that rhetoric, right? Uh, the problem is that there's no evidence to support those claims that mainstream journalism has a liberal bias. And in fact, some of the evidence shows they bend over backwards uh, to show they don't have a bias and are harsher on Democrats than they are on Republicans. So that's the social science in terms of actually looking at those sources, uh, those media sources, uh, and looking for bias. And unfortunately, if people don't trust any journalism, then they're not getting the information that they need uh, to really see things like whether Trump is lying. Uh, or what successes the Biden administration has actually had, or what Kamala Harris's record is really like in California, uh, that the sources that you use are really critical. We live in an era where people, we have so much at our fingertips, like at our phones, uh, that it really allows us to search for information that just confirms our existing beliefs. And one of the things I teach my students is trying to get around that human tendency of confirmation bias, you have this belief on how things are, and you look for information, and what you stop at are those pieces of information that just reinforce your beliefs, uh, and that's what's known as confirmation bias. All humans do it, uh, but if you're aware of that, you can get around those sort of problems. Uh, anyway, so in terms of 
you know, I teach a whole course structured around uh, the different sources that are available for, for people to use and which sources to be careful and how to see red flags. There's a great book called Unspun, it's a little old, uh, by Jackson and Jameson, two political scientists who, who wrote a book to help people cut through the subtitle is Finding Facts in an Age of Misinformation. And I'd highly, you know, that's a really good book to take a look at, for example, on why you shouldn't trust websites like the one that you called up and how what to see as red flags in terms of uh, misinformation that is in our system. So, What's you the name of the book again? it's Unspun, uh, Finding Facts in the Age of Disinformation. Unfortunately, it's a little old, so a lot of the examples are from the 20, 2004 election. Uh, but the principles are still the same. Uh, they, they map out the uh, warning signs of trickery or spin. Uh, they, they explain what are the tricks of the misinformation uh, trade are. Uh, and then they talk about how you actually find good sources and how you judge those sources. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's by Jam Jackson and Jameson. You might have seen Kathleen Hall Jameson. She's often in the media. Uh, out of the Annenberg School, um, and they were part of what was behind creating factcheck.org. Um, Snopes, factcheck.org, political PolitiFact. Check those sources to check on what information you get from other sources. Um, anyway, sorry, rambling on. Uh, hi, I'm Jody. I just want to send something positive. I to Mary Alice, do you want to remember when Obama got the Affordable Care Act yeah. in? And it, it, well, it's better than it was because I've helped I've helped people who didn't have health insurance sign up and, and get something <laughs> good. But remember that John McCain came and voted when he was on his deathbed, just about to a pr you know to pass it. That's a great. Yeah, thank you. That's a great example in terms of okay, compromises that you have to take in a system. You get some wins, and in that case, in terms of reducing the number of uninsured, that was a huge win. And so the Medicare is yeah. So, well, think about the 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 Medicaid expansion. Okay. Okay. But again, you know, in terms of the big picture, in terms of the number of people covered by health insurance, dramatically expanded. If the Supreme Court had not struck down part of the law that required states to take the Medicaid expansion, we would have had almost complete universal coverage at that point. Again, it's something, you know, the way our system works, you know, we have people you, who disagree with us, you have to build compromises, you have to take the wins you can get, that was a great improvement over what we had before that. Um, it's not everything people might want in terms of healthcare coverage, uh, but it definitely was a step in the right direction, and people have benefited dramatically. Research has shown it has reduced inequality in our system, especially in those states that have accepted the Medicaid expansion. Uh, so that's definitely a great example. I'm gonna go over to this side of the room. Going back to your presentation, um, you laid out various structural, political, legislative uh, situations um, that, got, uh, that contributed to where we are today. So what, can, what do you recommend can be done? What can, uh, you know, I personally, and I'm sure most of us in this room always said, how did Germany descend in Nazi to fascism? Uh, we, we, now we've, we're seeing it here. So what can be done, given what you've outlined here, what steps can be taken to, uh, to w up keep our democracy standing? Pretty weighty question. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but my book, Saving American Elections, was the, the whole basis of it was the argument that what we need to do is diagnose what's wrong with the U.S. political system and our elections first, and then talk about prescriptions. 
And so in that book, there are an awful lot of prescriptions of how we can, the things that we can do to save our elections and our democracy. Uh, to you know, mention a few of them, I think going back to right now, I would say the most important is the media literacy and an understanding of what knowledge is in our society. And I would recommend Tom Nichols' book, The Death of Expertise, as the book for that, uh, kind of really understanding where we've gotten as a culture, our hostility to people who have some knowledge or expertise and are willing to think that we know more than people who have, you know, medical doctors who've studied things for years and years and years, but are clueless as far as vaccines or something along those lines. Um, so part of it is culture, and I think it really starts with us. I don't think we can pass any laws to regulate social media in a way to prevent misinformation from getting out there because every time they try to close the gates, the, the, those who spread misinformation find other ways to get that information out here. So I think education, going back to the earliest years all the way through people's adult lives, is really key to understanding uh, uh, or to fixing part of the problem. Um, you would think if people were better informed, Trump would not be getting as much support as he did. Even the, 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 the fact that they, the claims that you know, they support Trump because the economy was better under Trump, his was the best economy. No, that's not true. All right. you know, sure, the, Trump, the economy was good before the pandemic, but he totally mismanaged the pandemic. Uh, and you know, if you're going to just look at Trump's economy before the pandemic, you also then be fair Biden have to look at it some ways out from the pandemic after we recovered from the pandemic, and those are definitely comparable. Uh, the notion about prices, and you're going to support Trump even though he's pushing that, that, uh, that tariff. Uh, or going back to the comment like, you know, he, this is just his show and that it's not real. We don't have to trust it. Well, look at the recent history. You know, so if we're a little more aware of that, I would think that we would, there would be less support for Donald Trump. Understanding of what an authoritarian is, understanding how he spreads uh, and encourages people hate-wise uh, in our society. So that's one aspect, uh, and I have a whole cha chapter on the public on, in that book, and, it's, and another chapter on media, uh, which is critical, obviously. Um, there's a lot of good journalism out there, uh, and I try to, you know, going back to students, trying to get them to understand and identify what good journalism is versus what, inf you know, what's out there that they shouldn't trust or what's not providing them with any inf the information that they need. Uh, structurally, you know, there's debates over do we get rid of the Electoral College. Um, I actually don't think we should get rid of the Electoral College, but I think we should amend the Electoral College to make it so one political scientist proposed uh, a reform to it uh, to give the winner of the popular vote additional electors. You know, you win, the, uh, you win each state, you get their electors, and then you win the popular vote, you get a set of electors, say an additional 100. Uh, and what that does is it preserves some of the good things about the Electoral College. And it's like, what's good about the Electoral College? Well, it makes candidates pay attention to states they probably wouldn't pay attention to if it was just the pure popular vote. So that's why that electoral college was set up in the first place as a federal election to make sure the states had representation in a way. So you can amend the electoral college in a way that makes it much harder to win the popular vote and lose the election, but you can also keep in those incentives that make the candidates go to the, uh, as many states as possible for their campaigns and not just focus on big urban areas. And in fact, when I first moved to Vermont in 1992, we were a battleground state. Bill Clinton showed up and campaigned. I went to a rally in my first fall here on Lake Champlain, he was at Perkins Pier, gave a huge rally, more people showed up than in the city of Burlington. You know, so that would never happen if it was just pure popular vote. Why would anyone come to Vermont? And so one of the problems with a lot of reforms out there is they don't think about the unintended consequences, what you lose when you shift. And that instead what you need to do is make sure you're savvy about hanging on to the good parts while addressing the negative parts. So, um, Um, 
I, I saw studies after the 2000 presidential election to see whether it may. The question is, what do, you, what do I think about proportional representation in the Electoral College? Um, studies after 2000 you know, said, okay, well, let's say you know, they, they basically crunched the numbers. If it were proportional representation, George Bush still would have won. Uh, do by congressional district, George Bush still would have won. So those kind of fixes aren't necessarily going to address, address the problem. Um, yeah. How are we doing on time? 20 minutes. 20 minutes? I really like the idea of having a, more than one, you know, more than, more than two choices for, uh, for some of these high offices. I like the idea of third party candidates having at least a chance of uh, gaining enough support for, for election. However, I think the only way that that could happen is through ranked choice voting. So I'm wondering what your take is on ranked choice voting. So th this is going to be uh, <laughs> Professor Grzynski takes unpopular positions. <laughs> Save the Electoral College. Ranked choice voting is not going to solve our problems. Um, again, my explanation about the nature of our two-party system. Uh, it creates this incentive to build a majority coalition before the election. And the benefit of that is once that majority coalition is in office, they can work together. Ranked choice voting really breaks down those incentives. So then you have a fragmented control of the legislature after the election if any of those minor party candidates get in there. The, yeah, exactly. And look at the instability of multi-party systems as well that isn't a part of the problem of our system. Uh, the other thing on ranked choice voting is that there are these mathematical problems that pop up that actually, you know, rank, uh, advocates of ranked choice voting say that it is a simpler way to vote. You just vote your heart. You don't have to be strategic. That's bullshit. And I'll explain why that's the case. Um, and I, I actually did an analysis of one of Burlington's elections a while back uh, when they had ranked choice voting, 2009. And so this is tied to the fact that mathematicians, they took, they look at ranked choice voting a long time ago. And in fact, one mathematician, Kenneth Arrow, won a Pulitzer Prize for his uh, proof that in, when you rank choices in an election, you can have a system where you have we uh, anomalies that pop up. So for example, if you think of a three-person race, candidate A, candidate B, candidate C, it is possible that a majority of the public prefers A over B, and then a majority of the public prefers B over C, and then a majority of the public prefers C over A. Where's your majority? That's what he won a prize for, demonstrating that. There are other anomalies that happen. Uh, one is the no-show paradox, which I think is the most damning, and that is that for some voters, they would be better off staying home than showing up on election day. And that was the case for Republicans in Burlington in 2009. Uh, because what happened was the race was so close between the top three candidates. Uh, you know, the, the person who came out on top in the first round, I believe, was the Republican. Uh, the second was the progressive, and the third was the Democratic candidate. So. What ended up happening is you drop out the Democratic candidate, you get the progressive candidate, wins and becomes mayor, Bob Kiss of Burlington. Um, what, do you what do you think progressives, uh, what do you think Republicans thought of the ideology of progressives? Farther away from them than Democrats or closer? So, yeah, so if they had stayed home, they would have gotten a better result. So strategically, you screw up by voting that way. The other thing is, if you look at the you know, the A to B to C to A again. So you look to, you know, you look at, all right, let's see, how did uh, uh, Andy Montrell do versus K Kurt Wright? Uh, majority of voters, according to their ranking on the ballots, preferred Montrell to Wright, okay? All right, well, let's look at the face-off between uh, uh, Bob Kiss and Andy Montrell. A majority of voters preferred Andy Montrell. But since the race was so close, even the majority of voters preferred that candidate over the other ones, that candidate lost the race because they came in third, all right, in the first round of votes. And so strategically, as a voter, there are a lot of things you have to think of if you're ranking people's your choices in the election.
All right. Another one, weird one, is you could actually give Bob Kiss more votes and make him lose, which shouldn't happen in an electoral system. So then you ba the other thing back up and think about is um, going into the voting booth, your calculus as a voter is going to be different um, if it's a, you know, a, a race, a single race without ranked choice voting. You know, you got to be strategic in both of these. Um, but that's going to lead to different behavior in terms of the candidates trying to build their coalition. So knowing how that might work out, you know, Republicans might want to build their coalition a little different uh, in order to win the kind of rank, uh, uh, a straight up race between a Democrat and a, a progressive and a Republican. And in fact, you see that more recently, even though they still have ranked choice, they don't even offer up a candidate because they know that actually could harm who actually gets elected. So that, then the other thing is, seeing our ballots, how long and complicated our ballots are. And going back to 2000 election, a lot of voters had trouble uh, in terms of finishing up their voting. If you look at stats on voting, there's what's known as ballot drop off, where people will vote you know, at the top part and then they don't re vote for the rest of the ballot. Yeah, so, well not even that, they just, they're exhausted. So you're going to increase the complexity of our ballots dramatically. And it's great for political junkies who have all their time on their hands to make those decisions. But for the average voter, you're really increasing the cost of voting in terms of gathering information and the time they take to cast their votes. So that's my take on it. You know, other people have different takes on it. But nobody has taken the data from Burlington and said, you know, that the calculations are any different in terms of those paradoxes that pop up from ranked choice voting. So I actually have in my head a study I'm going to do out in the, f the future. I'm going to gather results from a lot of other elections that are doing ranked choice around the country and see how many times these paradoxes pop up. Uh, um, so, yeah, that's my, my long thing on ranked choice voting. All right, we'll go to the back. Sort of, sort of returning to the upcoming election, I'm looking at this last point on your display here, and it has to do with policy differences. And you know, if people really understand the policy differences, the choices will be clear. It's my impression that this time around, policies are not much of an issue. It's personalities, it's information, disinformation, you know, emotions, and so on. I, I wonder what your perspective is at this point on how much policy is important to the upcoming election, policy differences. <laughs> Excellent point. And in fact, I just talked to my class about this yesterday, you know, that the fact that a lot of people are, you know, you talk to voters, undecided voters, people who switch between, say, voting for Obama and voting for Trump or, uh, you know, those kind of individuals, a lot of them are voting based on personality. Uh, a lot of people support Trump because they believe he um, represents people like them. It has nothing to do with the policies. So even like union members voting for Trump, thinking that he represents people like them, given his policies on unionization uh, and his attitudes towards unions. Uh, so a lot of the public, and unfortunately, a lot of the public is going to decide this election, the undecided or the voters that swing back and forth. They're voting based on things such as that, personality, uh, some voters saying, you know, that, you know, that they're voting based because, you know, Trump's an entertaining guy. Going back to the comments, you know, and it's just his, g it's just his show. We don't really have. He's not really going to do those sort of things. So that's definitely uh, a big problem in our system. Individuals who are strong partisans who have voted in and participated in elections for a long time keep a mental scorecard and they know the policy differences. And for them, it's pretty simple and straightforward. They know what they're going to vote for long before the election starts because the record of Democrats or Repub and Republicans is really clear over time. Uh, so they're, you know, for those voters, policy and ideology, ideology differences matter. But for the people who are just voting based on personality, who aren't well informed, don't pay much attention. One of, one of the biggest myths about uh, uh, democracy in the U.S. that political scientists have demonstrated empirically is they're often, you know, we hold up in our civ civics classes the idea of an independent voter uh, who is the ideal voter of 
democracy. But it turns out if you ask people and you find out who those independents are, they tend to be the most poorly informed, the least involved, and the least engaged in politics. That if you actually pay attention, comedians are doing this now, that if you're actually paying attention, it's a no-brainer in terms of this race. You know, you must have been kicked in the head by a horse, as Jimmy Kimmel, I think, was, was his comment about that. If you, if, you, if you can't see the difference right now, and you're just not paying attention, paying attention to good sources of information that'll tell you what's been happening. Uh, can I take one more question? Yeah. Did you go? Okay, anybody else? Sorry, Jody. Back to the, back to the mainstream media. Um, in both NPR news reports recently and on CBS and NBC, I hear um, introductory reports about something that Trump said, making him seem rational, <laughs> which is followed by a report that Harris was doing a rally in Michigan. And the, and the obvious bias there, and this is in those mainstream medias, is there anything you can do about that? <laughs> well, no, I, I mean, I think her comment was more about how the press covers the election. Uh, and they're covering it like it's a normal election, and it's not, and that's the problem. And there are plenty of journalists who have written, look, we can't treat this like a normal election, but they go ahead and they treat it like a normal election, and they have this notion that balances giving both sides, like they have equal weight in their arguments, when we're in an era where that's not true. Well, right. yeah. You nailed it, exactly. And so there's an awful lot of that that's going on. Um, but again, too, Trump has just worn everybody, including the journalists, down at this point. So some journalists are, are kind of raising the concerns like, look, we're not covering how crazy this individual is, how much his capabilities have actually degraded in, in the last year or so, uh, and that we're just treating him, like you said, you know, like they take a clip that makes him sound normal. But, you know, it's like if a half hour ago I said, oh, let's forget questions and let's just have a dance party. You guys think I'm crazy. But our, Trump did, yeah, uh, just did that a few days ago. And he just swayed on stage and demanded them. That you guys didn't hear that one? <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, well, no, but after that, and his own staff pleaded, take two more questions. That, that was on his, uh, what, are, what do you call those things? <laughs> Teleprompters, thank you. Uh, it was on his teleprompter, they wanted him to take more questions, and no, he just, you know, played music and swayed uh, <laughs> on stage. But anyway, you guys were awesome, great questions. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for inviting me, and hopefully you got a good amount out of this. <laughs>